Hello and welcome to the webinar, everyone. Report back from the SGO, what's the latest in uterine cancer? I'm Kitty Silverman, Uterine Cancer Program Director at SHARE. Before the presentation begins, I'd like to tell you a little bit about SHARE. SHARE is a national nonprofit that supports, educates, and empowers anyone who has been diagnosed with women's cancers and provides outreach to the general public about signs and symptoms because no one should have to face breast, ovarian, uterine, cervical, or metastatic breast cancer alone. For more information about upcoming webinars, support groups, and our helplines, please visit our website at sharecancersupport.org. All participants will be muted during the presentation. When Dr. Boyd finishes presenting, we will begin the Q&A discussion. You are welcome to submit questions during the presentation through the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. When asking questions, remember that Dr. Boyd is unable to give specific medical advice. So please keep your questions general in nature. I also wanted to mention that closed captioning is available. You can enable this feature by clicking the live transcript button on the bottom of the screen and selecting the subtitle option. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Leslie R. Boyd is an associate professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at NYU Langone Health. She currently serves as Director of Gynecologic Oncology at the NYU Perlmutter Cancer Center. After graduating from Harvard University, Dr. Boyd completed, completed medical school at Yale School of Medicine. She joined the NYU Grossman School of Medicine for both her OBGYN residency and fellowship in gynecologic oncology, and then stayed on as faculty member at NYU. A researcher and educator, Dr. Boyd has authored or co-authored more than 70 peer-reviewed publications and abstracts and presented at numerous conferences and guest lectureships. Her research focuses on surgical quality and outcomes research, disparities research, and cervical cancer therapeutics. Her leadership roles include chairing the Physician Payment Reform Task Force for the Society of Gynecologic Oncology, and serving as the diversity ambassador at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, where she is passionate about mentoring trainees at all levels. Dr. Boyd is a native New Yorker and is proud to give back to her diverse community in her daily work. Please welcome Dr. Leslie Boyd. Thanks so much, Kitty. I really appreciate what a generous introduction. Um, I've been at NYU for a very long time, as you know. So as a result of that, I've known about SHARE for a very long time. And I just, it's a, really a pleasure to be able to give back to a group that has given so much to so many of my patients over the years. So whatever we can do for you, I'm happy to do it. And I hope you guys find today's discussion of benefit. So without further ado, let me share my screen. Wonderful, thank you. Great, sorry about that, I'll start again. Um, so we are gonna review, generally speaking, how you treat endometrial cancer and the biology behind it so that we can understand some of the more advanced abstracts at SGO this year. And then we'll get right to the breaking news. We'll talk about a couple of therapeutic clinical trials that were reported out. We'll talk more about the molecular classification of endometrial cancer which is really a really um, important hot topic right now and, and how we see patients going forward. We'll talk about disparities in cancer outcomes, which is a significant issue for patients with endometrial cancer. And we'll also talk about modifiable risk factors, in this case, obesity and its relationship to endometrial cancer. And then we'll review a little bit, kind of a, a, a quick wrap up. So here's the overview. So endometrial cancer, as most of you know, is the most common GYN cancer in the United States. Thankfully, the majority of them are, have a fairly good prognosis. They are early stage and low grade at the time of diagnosis. They are associated with obesity and associated with increased estrogen levels. Because the endometrium does, is kind of is unstable when it gets thicker, most women will have bleeding and that will give us kind of the heralding event that something is wrong. And as a result, they'll present relatively early and will be surgical candidates and will be cured often after that surgery. But there is a growing percent of patients who have 
a higher grade cancer. That means that the cells under the microscope look more aggressive than they should. And those cells are more likely to metastasize or move away from the uterus by the time it's diagnosed. That leads to patients having a more advanced stage of diagnosis and having a much worse prognosis. So we have a historical classification for endometrial cancer that was pretty basic. And it was based on mostly what did the cells look like under the microscope. And so we had two general types, a type one and a type two. Type one was the majority of standard endometrial cancers. These cells looked like endometrial glands. So we called it endometrioid cells. They were associated with obesity, associated with a younger age at diagnosis, and overall have a favorable prognosis. This compares to type two endometrial cancers, which are a different cell type than a normal endometrial gland. They vary, but can be called either serous or clear cell or carcinosarcoma. They may or may not be associated with obesity. They tend not to be re related to elevated estrogen levels. They come on at an older age in general and have a poor prognosis. So the reason why this is so important nowadays, and I think you know, endometrial cancer, because it's so commonly was cured with surgery, really was not on the radar screen appropriately for some of our, for researchers and the NCI, for example, the National Cancer Institute. But we have a major epidemiologic problem with endometrial cancer at the current time. Unlike the vast majority of cancers that we track in the United States, endometrial cancer is one of the few that has an increased incidence and increased mortality, which means that more women are getting the disease and more women are dying of the disease. So this is, looks at some of the cancer statistics that we can project out annually. And if you see almost all of these curves are, are trending down. And here's endometrial cancer or it's uterine cancer, but the problem is that that purple line includes both the uterine corpus, which is uterine cancer, and uterine cervix, which we define as cervical cancer. And if you split out the two, uterine corpus actually is hooking back up in terms of the deaths. So we have a real problem on our hands. And that's why what we're gonna review today is of is particular importance. So briefly, I'm gonna go through the general treatments. So, Early stage disease, so uterine confined disease, should be surgically staged. You remove the uterus, the tubes and ovaries, and assess the lymph nodes. We prefer to do this with small incision surgery. Um, and then whether or not you need additional treatment beyond the surgery is dependent upon what we find at pathology. So sometimes we'd like to give additional radiation to the top of the vagina. Sometimes we need to give whole pelvic radiation in certain, certain circumstances. And sometimes if the, the, the cells are aggressive enough, if they're those type two cells, we may suggest chemotherapy even if it's early stage disease. For stage three to four A disease, so this is disease that's outside of the uterus, um, but not distant, so still localized uh, in the abdomen. We do like to remove that disease whenever possible. There's probably a benefit to getting all the disease out, although there's no good trials to determine that. We do use combination chemotherapy to reduce the risk of the disease coming back. The standard is a combination of car carboplatin with paclitaxel or taxol, which is easier for me to say, so I'm gonna say that going forward. And if patients are found to have a serous cancer, one of those type two cancers, with a specific receptor positive, the HER2 receptor, then we know that there is a benefit to getting a new uh, biologic drug, new to endometrial cancer anyway, called trastuzumab. And additional radiation may also be beneficial. I highlighted the trastuzumab in yellow because that is a relatively new development. In the past three years, we've had a few new drugs in our armamentarium for endometrial cancer. And you'll see there's some yellow here as well. So this is for patients who have widely advanced disease at the time of diagnosis or recurrent disease. Again, chemotherapy is gonna be the backbone of treatment with carboplatin and taxol, depending on whether it got before. You know, we've been giving hormonal therapy for Estrog, uh, endometrial cancer because it's estrogen receptor positive in many cases for years. And in fact, you could argue it's one of the, the first kind of personalized medicines we've been doing. 
In addition to that, we think that we know that uh, trastuzumab or Herceptin is beneficial for some serous cancers. And now we have immune therapy, which can be beneficial depending on some of the um, markers of the cancer that we'll talk about a little bit later. And again, it's great to see new options for our patients, which again have been approved in the last few years. So now we're gonna get to what we found out at SGO, and we're gonna start with the therapeutic clinical trials. So this is a trial that came out of Dana-Farber and some other institutions in Boston, looking at letrozole, which is an aromatase inhibitor, and abamaciclib, a BEMA, we're gonna call it, uh, in estrogen receptor positive recurrent or metastatic endometrial cancer. So these were for those patients in that last slide who have disease beyond the uterus or widely metastatic. So the concept here is again, as I said, and we're not gonna get, I'm not gonna go into the weeds in terms of the biology, although you're welcome to ask me after the talk. Um, we use estrogen receptor, for estrogen receptor positive endometrial cancer, we have used hormonal therapy for years, and there's a multitude of agents we can use. But unfortunately, many patients will develop resistance to those therapies, which can be a problem. And we know that there are reliable ways that the cells gain resistance. There are different pathways. If you think about it, the cells should not be able to divide, right? So a, a cancer cell is a cell that has the capacity to divide more frequently than it should and to move into spaces that it shouldn't move. A, a healthy cell stays put and doesn't divide. So cancer cells have to find mechanisms or pathways to get those additional um, activities. The, the, and so here are a couple of pathways that are used and that we think kind of rescue the cells from being sensitive to estrogen therapy. So the thought of these researchers was, let's not just block the estrogen receptor. That's what you're doing with the aromatase inhibitor. Let's block these pathways as well. And that's what the abema does. It's a CD4K inhibitor and happens to block kind of downstream from these other pathways. What was really interesting about this study is that, first of all, a few interesting things. These are both oral drugs, um, which, is, which is very nice. And this is just talking a little bit about how they designed the trial. We won't have to go into that now, but, but we can talk about it later. So here's the, 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 the response. There were no complete responses. There were only 30 patients, it was a small trial. But there were nine patients who had a partial response, which means that on imaging, they had at least a 30% difference or improvement in the size of the areas that they were following for the study. Another 13 or 43% of patients had stable disease, which means that the disease didn't shrink enough, or at least it didn't shrink by that 30% amount, but it didn't grow either. So it's kind of stayed the same. So that's 73% of patients who had, we call that a clinical benefit rate. So 73% of patients benefited from this. Seven patients though, 23%, the disease continued to grow despite the treatment. Um, so, and what's interesting about these studies, uh, and I think is something that we really like as physicians to highlight is that not everyone benefits, but there are a few surprisingly good responders in these trials. So this is, we call it a waterfall plot and all everyone on this side, we think is getting benefit from the drug because this is a decrease in the amount of, of the, in the size of the tumor cells. But all of the patients with the asterisks, those patients are were still on therapy at the time that they came up with the results. So they have, to, they have to stop the results at some point so they can report out. So it's possible that those patients are continuing to improve and continuing to derive benefit from the drug. So it's exciting to see that the combination of an aromatase inhibitor with the CD4K inhibitor that abema has activity in ER positive endometrial cancer. I didn't say this explicitly because we don't have a ton of time, but the toxicity was reasonable. And what's really interesting about this, patients had could have previously been on an aerobatase inhibitor and failed it. So this may rescue some patients in whom the aerobatase inhibitor is no longer working. I also didn't mention this, but it's important. 
only patients with endometrioid endometrial cancer showed benefit. That does make some sense because mostly endometrioid endometrial cancers are the ones who are ER positive. Um, the patients who had high grade cancers with the P53 abnormalities did not have benefit, which is what we would expect. They are unlikely to have estrogen receptors. And a beam is already, ER, uh, already FDA approved for estrogen receptor positive breast cancers, both alone and in combination in, in various um, situations. So it's, this is obviously a very short, small trial, but it, it gives us a lot of hope that there's gonna be another option going forward. So here's another small, small trial by Joyce Liu and her group, also Dana-Farber, um, looking at a novel combination that I wanted to bring up. So this is a combination of trametinib and nabitoclax in patients with RAS muta mutated gynecologic cancers in phase one, two study. So this is not just for endometrial cancers, although there are endometrial cancers in, uh, in the results, and we'll review that. But this is looking at a, a narrow window of patients. And I think what's interesting about this and that you'll see more, more and more often in our trials, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on as well, is that we are getting to understand much more about the specifics of these cancers. And this is what we would hope, hoped would happen once we started looking at molecular testing and getting to individualized cancer therapy, I think we, that, that concept has been thrown out for years, for 10 to 15 years, but we're really reaping that now and finding tumors with very specific pathways that we can then impact. And it doesn't matter if it's an ovary cancer or an endometrial cancer or a cervix cancer, if they have that pathway, we know we can reliably attack it. So that's something you'll be seeing more and more going forward. So in this case, I'm not, again, I'm not gonna go through the science too deeply, although you're welcome to ask me at the end. We're looking at a combination of a MEK inhibitor, which is the trametinib, and a BCL2 inhibitor. And the combination should increase the body's ability to shut down cancer cells. That's called apoptosis. And the goal here was to do two things. One, figure out is this effective? And two, figure out how, how is it looking in terms of safety and tolerability? So just getting to the, to the end here, the, this response rate was about 20% overall. Um, and they had used different doses of the trametinib and the nabitoclax. Uh, but the optimal dosing got them to about 20, 21%. Uh, and the stable disease rate was about 36%. So I wouldn't say that, the, the, again, that activity is not, you know, mind blowing, but it is interesting insofar as, like with the other trial, this is now a swimmer's plot. And so if you look the farther out you go, that, that, that explains how long patients have been on trial, right? And so the in the bars with arrows, those individuals are still on at the time that this was reported. And you can see there are a few arrows, arrows here and a few very long bars. So again, implying that for some patients, there will be particularly good benefit from this. So I like this because A, it's a novel drug with a new mechanism. It's always good to have something new in the armamentarium. Um, you know, the activity was moderate. It was, it was not a, a barn burner. But it, for some patients, there will be significant benefits. So it's our job to figure out which patients will be the, the winners in a, in a combination like this one. Something else to say is that, again, both of these are oral drugs. So it's very nice to have an oral drug regimen with some activity to offer our patients. All right, so now we're switching gears a little bit. We're going to talk for a lot of great talks at the SGO, looking at the molecular classification of endometrial cancer. So why are we looking at this? You know, we started out all of our cancer research using simple, um, what we call H&E slides. So simple stained pathology slides to make a lot of decisions about how to treat cancers. And unfortunately, that's an unreliable system. So just because something looks a certain way under the microscope, that doesn't always tell you how they're going to behave. So for example, and I, lo I love this from a, a good pathology article, 
all of these represent P53 abnormal or otherwise known as high grade endometrial cancers, but they look vastly different. This one actually looks like a garden variety endometrial cancer, like a grade one endometrioid. This one certainly looks much more like a clear cell and a serous. So, so your looks can be deceiving and we're making significant decisions based on looks alone, which is just not enough. So it turns out that if you check the genomes of endometrial cancer, you can reliably separate them out into four clusters. And those clusters are very important in terms of prognosis, in terms of outcome. So some tumors will be what we call poly ultra mutated. They have very a high number of mutations and tend to do exceedingly well. So this is the likelihood of being cancer free. And look, they're about at 100%. Other cancers, will be hypermutated with a microsite, microsatellite instability. And they do in intermediate, as does what we call a copy number low. Those are our endometrioid cancers. And then there are the cancers that have a, a poor prognosis. And these are copy number high, we call it serous like cancers. And so when you stratify by this, you can re more reliably assess how patients are, are going to do. And again, you can overlay, I love this, this kind of graphic, where you overlay what you see with the pathology slides with the actual changes based on the molecular classification, which just gives us a richer picture overall. So there are a group out of Memorial Sloan Kettering did a retrospective review of their endometrial tumors for just stage one, grade three endometrioid cancer. So these are endometrioid cancers, which should be favorable, but they have a higher grade on, on view. So they said, let's look at those patients again over the years. We're gonna make sure that the GYN pathology review was accurate. And we're gonna see based, we have clinical classifications, like I said in the beginning, in a presumed stage one endometrial cancer case, we may decide to give radiation and rarely chemotherapy based on some of the pathologic findings. So I said, well, let's see what we decided to give based on our usual pathology review. And then let's see what we would do based on how they did compare that to the molecular classification. So we use two big kind of landmark randomized trials to decide how to treat early stage endometrial cancer. One of them is called PORTEC-1, and we use those risk factors to decide whether or not you should be getting additional brachytherapy. That's the radiation to the top of the vagina. So they have high, inter if you have a high risk factor, you get the radiation. If you don't, you do not. So they look, went back and said, all right, so we classified those people into those who are gonna get the, who are high risk and those who are not high risk, according to Portec, how did they do? And when they looked at it, look at those lines, they did almost exactly the same. So the Portec one risk factors were not good at discriminating how patients were gonna do after adjuvant therapy. So I said, well, let's try this again. There's another randomized control trial called GOG99 that also looked at slightly different but similar intermediate risk factors. Let's see, then, so we suggest treatment based on this. So if we stratify by that risk factor system, how do we do? And similarly, maybe there's a little bit of daylight between these two slides, but pretty similar, not much difference in, in how patients do long standing. But look at this. If you look at how patients did by their molecular subtype, by looking at the things that we talked about before, and they happen to use different colors, that pop so in this case, Poly is yellow, the intermediate one here, MSH, MSI high is green, and then we have copy number low, and then copy number high, which we know is the worst actor, very reliably differentiated out, much more so than the GOG99 or Portec one. And if you do it just as a, a bifurcation with copy number high and everyone else, well, look how that stratifies out. So copy number high again, can reliably do a lot worse. So, so the criteria that we routinely use 
are not predictive for stage one, grade three endometrial endometrial cancer patients. Whereas molecular classification is, and what's particularly interesting about this is that we do not routinely get molecular classification. It certainly it's not FDA approved for early stage endometrial cancers. So this is a very small study, but if this is validated in a prospective kind of larger study, I think would change the standard and allow us to get um, molecular classification for all of our tumors and act on it more appropriately. Another study looked at MLH1 hypermethylation and if it predicts poor outcomes with a checkpoint inhibitor called pembrolizumab in recurrent endometrial cancer. This was from Dr. Borden and her group in the University of Oklahoma. So just to step back a little bit, um, for every endometrial cancer patient that we see, we check their tumor for mismatch repair proteins because that's a known pathway for the development of endometrial cancer. It's also related to Lynch syndrome, which is an inherited form of endometrial cancer. So it's really important for us to identify that for the patients and their families. Um, and, but there are two ways to have a loss or a mismatch repair or a loss of that protein staining on the pathology. The most common way is something called methylation. So the reason we don't see the stain is because there's a change in the DNA that happens kind of uh, through what we call an epigenetic function. So it's not, it's not something you were born with, but something that happens over time. And we see that in, in sporadic cancers or non-germinal um, uh, genetic related diseases. The other way you can have the loss of the staining is through a true absence of these genes through the um, loss in Lynch syndrome. And so either way, whether it's because of the methylation or because of the Lynch syndrome, you're eligible for, the, for pembrolizumab, which is an immune checkpoint inhibitor. The question is, does pembrolizumab work just as well for these patients who have the sporadic cancers as it does for those who have the loss through to, through, due to a germline or a genetic predisposition? And so this is a retrospective study and looking at patients who met that criteria. Now, the numbers are small, right? So we're looking here at six patients um, and here we're looking at 12 patients. So these are small numbers, but you can see the response rate certainly differs based on whether or not the, the genes are methylated or, or if they're silenced, a change that happened during the lifespan or if they inherited that change. So patients who inherited the genes were most, more likely to have a complete response to the pembrolizumab or, partial, or stable disease. So they got some clinical benefit no matter what. So they had a partial response, complete response, or stable disease. Compare that to the patients who had uh, the, the gained or the somatic, we call it, loss in uh, MLH1. And in those patients, Half of them did not respond, they had progressive disease, and only a small number had a complete or partial response. So again, very small numbers, but here's a look at this. Because of the small numbers, I'm, I'm kind of surprised that they, they actually had a, a statistical significance, but the difference in survival was so significant they had to show it. So um, pretty dramatic. So patients who have the, um, deficient MMR genes because of the germline mutation, because of Lynch syndrome, are going to respond much better than those who gain it because of the methylation. And similarly, that's true for progression-free and overall survival. Um, and for, you know, again, showing this, that the patients who had the germline, they had not even hit, come anywhere close to a median survival. So that's survival um, the 50% mark. So this is kind of this is something we've been wondering about. This confirms that not all deficient mismatch repair tumors are the same. Um, it certainly does need clarification with a much larger data set, but it's something to consider and really important for setting expectations of patients. I will say that for some patients, you know, a 50% clinical benefit rate 
may be better than other more toxic regimens. So it doesn't mean that this is going to throw this out for all of these patients who have the methylation. It's just something in terms of setting expectations. All right, so now we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about disparities. Um, we already spoke about why overall that there's a, a problem with an increased mortality and incidence of endometrial cancer in this country currently. And one of the main reasons for this is um, the, the marked disparity um, in black women with endometrial cancer. So if you look, there's a busy slide from um, Eakin et al, also reviewed it at SGO. Um, if there are, obesity is a problem throughout, um, but if you look at the high risk endometrial cancer, these are those previously classified as, as type two, or you could say are copy number high cancers. Um, look at the slope, the increase in cancers among black women um, is, is dramatic. And so this is really driving that hook on the, the, the graph that I showed earlier. And so we know, unfortunately, black women just do far worse with this cancer. There's a higher mortality risk. And, and this is really for, for most cancers, unfortunately, in the United States, because race is such a, a, a strict, strongly predictive marker of overall health and well being, that unfortunately, for most cancers in the United States, um, Black individuals will do worse than their white counterparts. But something that's really interesting for endometrial cancer that we don't see for most cancers. For most cancers, we see you're more likely to have an advanced stage, um, you know, less likely to have screening, et cetera. But the biology of the tumor is really different. That's not true for Black women. There's something about the biology. There's something about having more of these high-grade tumors that we don't understand. All right, so um, one of the really interesting uh, oral presentations was by Dr. Saleh, one of, one of NYU's prior residents. So she looked at how does race impact uterine cancer surgical treatment? Um, so she looked at the SGO, Society of Gynecologic Oncology, has a clinical outcomes registry that was happened for about five years total, where a series of SGO, basically university-led sites, compiled all of their surgical data and put it into a registry. The benefit here is that there's a, like a good follow-up and these are all very large reputable institutions. So what did they find? Just jumping right into it. So black women are, are not as, are, had higher comorbidities and they were not as healthy as white women in this group. And so um, that's one thing that you just have to take hard to control for. ASA has to do is the, um, American Society of Anesthesia class. And so they, they, they have specific classes describing preoperative health so that the anesthesiologists can, can speak to one another about relative health of their patients. And as I was just saying, not surprisingly, we see that these type two cancers are more common in black women than white women. And the less risky endometrioid cancers are less common in black women. Great. Similarly, as, as expected, black women are more likely to have grade three cancers, more likely to have stage four disease, and less likely to have stage one disease. So, given all of that, so when we go stage for stage, so for stage one cancer, black women are less likely to have minimally invasive surgery. Again, this is at kind of very well reputed centers, and they're less likely to have a sentinel lymph node biopsy for a stage one endometrioid cancer. Um, and they're more likely to have post-operative complications. So I, I really like this study because one of, the, one of the reasons that we think about for the poor outcomes in Black women is that they're often going to community centers. They may not be at the same number of kind of academic centers of excellence. Well, here was a database really only looking at academic centers of excellence. And even in that study, we could not, you know, there were, there were differences. The one confounder that, that, that Dr. Sally does not discuss that I think is important is that black women are also much more likely to have uterine fibroids, right? So fibroids are benign growths of the uterus. And so you can have endometrial cancer and have fibroids and they'd be completely unrelated, but 
a really large fibroid uterus might make it hard for you to do a minimally invasive procedure. So that's one thing that's not discussed that we have to think about. But still, I think really makes you think and hopefully makes all of us think as surgeons that how can we do better for this patient population. Uh, study out of our own institution at NYU, one of our fellows, Dr. Olivia Lara, looked at racial disparities in uterine serous cancer, specifically looking at the molecular sequencing in, for all of our patients from 2017 to 2021. And specifically looking at these 45 patients with serous cancer for whom we had the testing available. And that was brought out looking at race, right? So for uterine serous cancer, look at the differences. For, for all cancers, 27% um, of our patients were Black, but we're completely overrepresented when it comes to uterine serous cancers, which is what we're saying before, but going to dramatic to continue to see the same pattern. And we found a difference in a specific genetic alteration that did seem uh, much more common in black patients. We did not find that genetic alteration in white patients in the CCNE1 gene. And if you stratify by the CCNE1, in this case, it's an amplification, um, which is the abnormality. If you stratify by a normal CCNE, versus an amplified CCNE, you reliably looked at uh, survival differences between the two groups. So again, this is another confirmation of different outcomes bit, uh, for black women with endometrial cancer. And in particular, in this case, looking at a specific target, which may be one of the biological underpinnings driving these outcomes. So this is a very small study. It will need confirmation, but there are um, national uh, consortium groups that are pooling together their endometrial cancer molecular data. NYU is one of those. And hopefully through that consortium, we'll be able to answer this question. All right, so moving on to obesity. So very often patients will ask me, what can I do about the cancer that I have? And again, in this case, endometrial cancer, but they ask me this for every cancer. Many cancers really don't have a modifiable risk factor of note but certainly endometrial cancer often is associated with obesity. So it's something that I'm commonly talking to my patients about. So it's very helpful to me to get more science behind what's causing it. What is the link between obesity and cancers in general and certainly obesity and endometrial cancer. So this was a, a really interesting study by Garrett and their group at, at McGee Women's looking at EGFL6 which is a growth factor for tumors in endometrial cancer. So this is a epidermal growth factor-like domain. I'm not gonna use that again, but anyway, EGFL6 is associated with worse, worse prognosis. So here's high EGFL6 um, expression and low expression. You can see that the survival uh, differs based on that finding. And it can be overexpressed in endometrial cancer. And what they found was that um, EGFL6 levels decrease with weight loss. So if you lose weight, you can decrease the serum or the blood, blood um, EGFL6 uh, levels. So that would imply that there's um, uh, something here that could be a modifiable factor. And in this case, they looked at cell growth, not, not in humans, but uh, in cell lines. And they looked at cell lines that produce excess EGFL6 and that produce very little EGFL6. So in this case, they looked at tumor volumes in these two different cell types. So the pink one here is the cell line that makes too much EGFL6. And you can see they, the tumor volume is growing compared to standard. And in this case, here's the control, but um, this is a cell line with CDFL6 knocked down, meaning it does not have the ability to, to, to make EGFL6 anymore. And look at the minimal tumor volume. So very impactful just with that change in that one gene. And this is a, a little bit squeamish, but so they used a mouse model 
And when they then at the, when we do mouse models, we do the intervention and then unfortunately we have to sacrifice the mouse to look to see what we find. And as you can see, this is a healthy mouse and this is a, an obese mouse, right? Because it's EGFL6 is overexpressed. And when you look at mice, just generally speaking, I will tell you the, it's very hard to find the uterine, uterus in mice. It's a very thin structure with very thin horns and sometimes it's very hard to find. In these mice, it was not hard to find at all. The uter uterus, the uterine horns were very pronounced, very um, enlarged with too much vascularity. And look, this, this size is quite significant. So they show that not just uh, in both a, 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 a Petri dish and a mouse model, EGFL6 seems to be very important in terms of uh, increased or, or what is move, making obesity the problem for endometrial cancer. Interestingly, there are several EGFL6 inhibitors under evaluation. So stay tuned um, and we'll see. Now, this is one that's gonna be very popular because you know we, we, everyone thinks about what's the best way to diet for lots of reasons, but from the standpoint of an endometrial cancer wondering, so if you, if you are overweight, what's the best way from a tumor standpoint to lose weight? And so this was looking at intermittent fasting uh, compared to other types of diet in, uh, again, not a human model, but a preclinical model of endometrial cancer. And in this case, this was a poster patient paper by Burkett et al. out of UNC, a great group there. And so they looked at mice again. So they took specific mice and they fed one set, we go up here, a high fat diet. And there was one set that just got a low fat diet the whole time. The high fat diet mice then got put on a diet. So either they kept going with high fat diet or they were switched to the low fat diet or they had went to an energy restricted diet, which is intermittent fasting. And so after that, they um, evaluated them. They gave, they, they gave them the endometrial cancer because they can induce that. And then they looked to see what happens with the tumors based on the different dietary profiles. So it turns out that the mice who were switched to intermittent fasting had the best responses in terms of their own body weight and their tumor growth. So the intermittent fasting group is in yellow. And so here they are compared to the high fat group. The high fat group pretty much does the worst all the time, but even better than the, the low fat group that had stayed low fat, they did a little bit better than that. Um, when it came to looking at hormonal profiles, they all did quite well as compared. So insulin and leptin are known to be important hormones in terms of mediating uh, endometrial cancer, uh, tumorigenesis, and those pathways. And both all, either the low fat, the consistent low fat, the low fat switch, or the intermittent fasting was all better than staying on the high fat diet. So again, this is a mouse model. We can't, we can't make too much out of it, but it is interesting that intermittent fasting did seem to be the most effective in reducing tumor growth. Um, the team is now going to look at giving chemotherapy with the various dietary regimens, which I think is really interesting. And of course, you know, the, 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 the benefit of using mice is that you can strictly control their diet. And, and you know, of course, it's a very um, artificial scenario. In a human model, things are much more complicated. So this is a very early, but, but, but certainly intriguing information to have. All right, so a quick wrap up here right on time. Um, again, molecular classification is going to continue to play a major role in how we treat endometrial cancer patients. Um, we'll likely move into early stages to determine adjuvant therapy, so stay tuned for that. We know it will you know, increase our uh, ability to give different biologic agents to our standard chemotherapy backbones, so you will continue to see new approvals new drugs coming out um, for advanced um, and metastatic disease. So like I just said, there's new hormonal agents and combinations that are coming out, which I think are very exciting, and new molecular-based targets that we have. Again, the, whatever we can do to expand the armamentarium is a good thing. Racial disparities continue to drive terrible outcomes, broadly speaking, for these patients. And it is a multifactorial problem that will be that will need a significant set of resources to answer. 
I'm happy to say that the NCI is now taking this very seriously and looking at endometrial cancer more broadly um, and funding it better, which is great to see, and also kind of funding various options in terms of improving outcomes for all patients. And again, diet is a critical modifiable factor in this disease. And I think, you know, we will continue as researchers to look at what is transmitting the, you know, what is making obesity specifically risky for these patients. It's more than just estrogen, you know, it's, it's, it's more uh, complicated than that. And what is the most effective way to change your risk? All right, and with that, I'm just looking to thank Kitty and Cher for all the tremendous work you've done for our patients over the years. Uh, it's a pleasure to spend the time with you this afternoon, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Boyd. That was incredibly interesting to, to learn about all the, the great work going on at SGO um, and all the advances that are being made. So I'm gonna start with a few um, questions, but before I do, uh, just to tell everyone, you can still submit uh, questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try to get through all of the submitted questions, but we may not uh, be able to due to time constraints. So a couple of really interesting questions came in live. Um, can you assess molecular levels after a diagnosis? Because I know you mentioned that it's usually done with later stage um, disease, but I just wanted to find out more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So we can do what we call next generation sequencing on, really it just depends on the tumor purity. That gets, gets a little bit complicated, but we can do it at any point at the diagnosis, as long as there's sufficient tumor available. Um, so what's interesting and in, in we have looked at kind of as a field, if you have the cancer initially diagnosed and then it comes back, let's say it comes back three years later, is it helpful to do another molecular classification? Meaning is that tumor three years later similar, sufficiently similar um, to the one that you evaluated the first time around? And in most cases, they are quite similar. So we don't think it's absolutely necessary to do a new molecular profiling, although from time to time, it, it does seem to make sense. It is interesting, thank you. Um, a few questions about the whole obesity and, and, and weight issue. Um, first, how is EGFL6 measured? Is that something? Yeah, so, it's, so that is, uh, to my knowledge, that would be right now a research measurement. So I, I don't think that we can get that you know, just you can't go ask for an EGFL6 level. No, mm -hmm. um, that is a specialized panel at the current time. So this is not ready for prime time. You can't just check it. Okay. And so what, but would losing, it, would losing weight have an impact on recurrence um, due to some of the things that you saw on, at, the, at the SGO? Yes, and I, I will say that that's been established previously as well. So I think, um, Van Gruengen did a lot of work of this a few years back, looking at what's the impact of weight loss on cancer recurrence for patients with endometrial cancer, and found that even a 10% reduction in weight was impactful in decreasing recurrence rates. So absolutely, that is true. Um, and so now we're just trying to figure out what is the mechanism behind that. So what's, what's mediating that change? But by all means, you know, uh, diet and exercise and weight loss is, is without question an important part of um, uh, anti-cancer strategy. That's good to know. And, and just one last question re related to obesity. Does it have such a strong link with other cancers or is endometrial really the main one where the link is, yeah. is as strong? Right, so that's a great, great question. So in general, if you look at the epidemiology of most cancers, obesity is, a, is obese patients are more likely to get cancer than non-obese patients, period. It's just that that's a broad general statement. And I'll go farther than that, which is to say that societies that tend to be obese tend to have more cancer. And beyond that, societies with Western diets, right, that are meat heavy, um, 
tend to get more cancers, right? So all of those are in alignment. So that is true, generally speaking. But without question, the, the link for endometrial cancer is a bit stronger than for most cancers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, do the findings, particularly about molecular classification, do they translate for carcinosarcoma or are they more specifically related to endometrioid um, disease? You know, so, so um, yes, they absolutely, so they certainly do translate for carcinosarcoma, although I will say that some of the initial molecular research did not include carcinosarcomas. Um, which is which is unfortunate, and so more work has to be done in terms of the characterization of that specific subtype. Um, you know, we know that carcinosarcomas carry a, a, a tough prognosis. So I think one of the what we're trying to do with molecular testing now is see well, two things: one, generate specific targets for treatment. And certainly carcinosarcoma patients can benefit from that standpoint, right? So if we find a new pathway that we can block that you know, is shared in a carcinosarcoma patient, then they will benefit from that. The other thing though, is to make sure that we are giving adjuvant therapy when needed and conversely not giving it if it's not needed, right? So. So that doesn't really apply to carcinosarcoma patients because we know their prognosis, generally speaking, is poor, you know. But, you know. but um, for other patients, like for the patients in that with that grade three or high grade endometrioid cancer, you may have a patient who has a, a poly mutation, like so it's ultra mutated, who you otherwise would have given additional treatment to. And as more data evolves, we may realize, you know what, those patients shouldn't get any additional treatment. Those patients, we should just leave alone. They will do fun on their own. So it's a way to ramp up therapy when needed, but also to back off so that we're not over-treating patients who would never have gotten a recurrence anyway. Okay, thank you. Actually, this is another um, question someone asked who related to, um, they were stage 3C carcinosarcoma. Um, and they were asking, is surveillance still the only way to go after all the frontline surgery, chemo, uh, et cetera? Or, or um, are we waiting for, are they just waiting for additional treatment when the recurrence occurs? Or is there anything with these new drugs or combinations that can be done preventatively? Yeah, and I, you know, that's, thank you for asking that question because I failed to put it in my slide because it's something, uh, something else that's also very new. So there is actually not, this was not reported at SGO because it's been generated a, a little bit prior to that, but there is new maintenance therapy for patients with endometrial cancer called Selenexor, right? So that patients can go on this therapy and I believe, so it has been fast-tracked for FDA approval, but is not yet completely approved for endometrial cancer. So really we're, we're, we're on the precipice of having this. Um, so for patients who complete frontline therapy, um, advanced stage of frontline therapy, uh, they'll be able to, they'll have the option of going on this medication that will reduce the risk or, at, 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 or extend their progression-free survival. So give them more time before a recurrence happens. So we're very excited that that's really, again, not quite, we're almost there. Um, we're just waiting for full approval. That, that's fantastic news. Yeah, it's great, <laughs> great news, absolutely. That's great. And there were, I wanted to get to a few of the pre-submitted questions. We still have a little, a little more time because um, I've been focusing on the live ones. Can you talk a little bit about, and this wasn't something in, in the talk, but C-A-R, I hope I'm saying it right. C AR dash T therapy and whether for cancers like uterine. Yeah, great. Okay, so let's car we call it CAR T therapy. CAR. So let me. I'm going to step back a little bit. CAR T therapy is a type of immunotherapy. So immunotherapy, if you think broadly speaking, I classify it in two ways: passive in your immunotherapy and active immunotherapy. So passive immunotherapy is a something like the drug pembrolizumab, which is a checkpoint inhibitor which boosts your immune system's activity, but it's pretty generic, right? You take, you, you get the, it's an injectable, you know, it's an IV drug. 
you get the same drug as everybody else. And it just generally boosts your immune system by blocking a specific pathway. I'm not gonna get the specifics of that, but so that's passive immunotherapy and, and can be really effective for some patients, right? And, and certainly. But then there's active immunotherapy where we actually specifically harvest your tumor, make uh, uh, immune cells, cancer killing immune cells specifically against your tumor mm. and then give them back to you. And actually it can be used in multiple solid tumors. So yes, and could be used for uterine cancer. But the kicker is that in order for it to work, you actually have to kill off all your own immune cells first. And that's because the immune system is very complicated. In addition to cells that kill cancers, our immune system also makes cells that protect the cancer. Not intentionally, but that's what they call them. We call them regulatory cells. And those regulatory cells kind of buffer the tumor against the immune system. So we have to kill off all of your immune cells and then only selectively put back the targeted cells that are gonna kill the cancer that, that we teach how to kill your cancer. So it's very active, right? It's a specific to your individual person. Can be a game changer for certain cancers, but it's very toxic because you have to have, we call it a lymphodepletion. You have to get this chemotherapy that effectively kills your, your immune system. So it is a great option for very healthy patients who do not have, who have extensive, who have, you know, life-threatening disease, who don't have a lot of standard options left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we are, we are starting CAR-T trials at our, at our center. We're very excited to start them. Because again, they can be a great option, but you have to pick your patients appropriately. Very interesting, thank you. And this is probably a question you get asked a lot in your practice, but are there any integrative holistic measures um, which can help with uterine cancer, any innovations, a ketogenic diet? Somebody mentioned mistletoe therapy, which I hadn't heard about. <laughs> um, and anything, um, anything, you know, like, like Holistic. Yeah, absolutely. So, so first of all, we did talk about intermittent fasting. So again, I think right. there's growing data, you know, about that on overall health indices. And now we see a little bit of data specific to endometrial cancer. So I will, you know, point back to that. And then, you know, it is, it's, it is hard. I, I how can I put this? I think very positively about um, integrative therapy in general. I think it's very hard to ascribe specific success to, immuno, to integrated therapy, meaning I don't know how to tease that out from other things that you're doing in terms of, you know, but certainly I think no question, lifestyle is important, exercise is important, but perhaps most importantly, I don't want to take too much time with this, but finding positive meaning with your cancer. So, uh, patients who are able to use what I'll call the cancer journey as a, uh, an, an expansive opening experience, they have done studies showing that those patients do better. And so it's, you know, it seems, you know, for some patients incredulous, how could, you know, this is a terrible thing. How is happening? How, how, how can I find, how can I find meaning through this? But so many patients do, as many of you may know, and those who are successfully do that you better. Yeah, that's wonderful. I'm going to sneak in one last question, even though that we're close to the time. Okay. This, this gets asked at support groups and other um, arenas. Would you explain the role of CA125 and its use in identifying and diagnosing recurrent uterine cancer? Absolutely. So CA125 is a bugaboo for many of our GYN cancers. As you know, it was initially designed to act as a marker for ovary cancer. And so Bob Bass actually tested 125 antigens. And you can tell you that CA125 was the 125th that he, that he tested, he probably went beyond that, but that's the one that worked the best. And so it has, there's, it is good at finding and good, but not great, good at finding um, serous cancers. So this can apply to uterine serous cancer, although it's not quite as good at, at uterine serous as it is for ovarian high-grade serous. 
but certainly falls down even with ovarian cancers and does not do a great job of detecting endometrioid or other cell types of ovary cancers. And similarly, you know, we think about 30 to 40% of advanced stage uterine cancers will have a CA125 signature that you can follow. So for those, so that 30 to 40%, that's helpful, right? So we can follow it during your surveillance and see what's going on. But again, for the majority of individuals, it's not going to be dramatically beneficial and so may not be helpful. That is really interesting and, and good to know. Thank you. This was such an informative program and we thank you so, so much for, for joining us. And, and thank you also for your incredibly kind words about SHARE. We, we really uh, are so grateful to partner with institutions like NYU and, and others and provide services to patients. So we really appreciate that. And thank you to everyone participating and submitting questions. Um, please take a moment to fill out the survey at the end of the webinar. The survey will show up in your browser when the webinar ends and the link will also be in the follow-up email. And all surveys are anonymous. And please check out SHARE's, Share's website at sharecancersupport.org uh, for information on other educational programs, support groups, volunteer opportunities, and much, much more. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Boyd, and thank you to everyone, and have a wonderful weekend all. Great. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Bye, guys.